Good evening, everyone. If you'll all uh, take your seats, we'll put this show on the road. My name is Robert Borisage. Uh, I am the co-founder of the Institute for America's Future and currently senior advisor to People's Action, which is a national organization with 30 grassroots affiliates in 20 states. And it's my pleasure tonight to be here to introduce to you, uh, many of you who know him, uh, Garel Perovitz, our speaker for this evening. First, let me pay tribute to Andy Shalal and busboys and poets for this. <laughs> Andy is a friend, uh, an activist, and a remarkable entrepreneur. He's built these vibrant centers of good food and good drink and good discussion and we get to enjoy it here tonight. Uh, Gar Al uh, if you don't know him, is a national treasure. He is uh, a path-breaking historian, a political economist, a strategist, an author, and an organizer. He's worked in both houses of Congress. He's created centers of political economy. He's written path-breaking books in history and in economics. Uh, he is an extraordinary uh, resource. Most recently, he's the co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative and the co-chair of its project, the Next, Next System Project, uh, which is seeking uh, real-world paths to creating a world that could be more just, more democratic, and sustainable. Tonight, he's going to talk about his new book, The Principles of a Pluralist Commonwealth, Copies of that are available uh, near the front. If you haven't gotten one, I recommend it to all of you. I just want to say a word to put this in a little bit of context, which is, um, you know, in Washington these days, people are 24-7 mostly fixated on the antics of President Chaos. <laughs> and uh, he struck again today, uh, wreaking havoc, uh, by withdrawing from the Paris Accord. Uh, and that will generate, uh, sensibly enough, uh, massive uh, opposition and resistance. And he has built uh, and, and deserves uh, a unified, fierce resistance across the country. But there's a danger to that, two dangers to it, really. One is in the fixation on uh, Trump's antics and his grotesqueries, we can easily forget the uh, fundamental failure of the political establishment of both parties over the last decades. So we had a recovery of eight years under George Bush in which the country grew more equal, the poor grew more impoverished, and the economy or the, uh, the environment was more destroyed. We then had a recovery, a great recession and a recovery under Barack Obama, and the country grew more unequal, uh, poverty became uh, even greater in our cities, and the eco ecological destruction outstripped any of our expectations or fears. Uh, we are fighting in wars without end and without a strategy for victory, and we have a, we have a political establishment uh, of both parties that has failed us. And the problem with resistance is that the default position on resistance is defense of the status quo. Right? We, we resist Trump because of the horrors he's inflicting on us, and we defend, the instinct is to defend the status quo, but that clearly is not enough. We desperately need both unity and resistance, but also a massive debate, a, a profound debate about a different course. And that is what uh, Gar's work is really about. Um, he... Uh, gets beyond the sort of hothouse politics of our day, and he asks profound questions. And in doing that, he has discovered that millions of Americans in thousands of projects may well be giving birth to a new system, to a new course for the country uh, that we could give, help give shape to and help, uh, in a sense, expose. He is unique, I think, in challenging us to think deeper and to dream bigger and to act more boldly. And obviously, nothing could be more important than that these days. So it's my pleasure to introduce Garel Perovitz.
thank you, Bob. And thank you all for coming out to, this evening. Really appreciate it. Um, I want to say thank you also <clears throat> to Kaylee Thornley and Will Flagel, who are here, and John Duda, who helped with this book. Thank you. <clears throat> there is a, um, as Bob says, I at one point ran House and Senate staffs, been there, done that. I've been a hard-nosed Paul, and I've been an organizer. But something is different about this book, which I want to suggest to you. And I want to read you the opening preface, a quote from Hannah Arendt, who my friend Mark Raskin brought to Washington many, many times to the Institute for Policy Studies. Here she is. It would be of some relevance to notice that the appeal to thought arose in the odd in-between period which sometimes inserts itself into historical time, into time when not only the later historians, but the actors and witnesses, the living themselves, become aware of an interval of time which is altogether determined by things that are no longer and by things that are not yet. In history, these intervals have shown more than once that they may contain the moment of truth. Now, what is Hannah Arendt talking about? She's talking about the appeal to thought in politics, not simply the appeal to power, not simply the appeal to interest groups, but when do ideas matter? Now, as Bob mentioned, I'm a historian and an economist and a writer, and I don't think ideas matter at all much of the time except sometimes, except sometimes. And that's what Hannah Arendt is talking about, and that's what I want to propose to you, that it is not only the building of political power that is necessary to stop this trajectory that we're involved in, but that at some point a reconstitution of the idea system we're working with is necessary, that you cannot move beyond it with new energies unless we understand the direction is different. So I want to say a little bit about that and what that might mean. But in one sense, it's pretty obvious. The traditional models of corporate capitalism and state socialism, state socialism long dead, but the, the default position was corporate capitalism, our capitalism, balanced by a reforming politics. And as Bob said, the default position is where we are or where we were. That reforming politics also in all of the advanced capitalist countries, had a systemic design. The design was called social democracy in Europe. It was called progressive or liberalism in the United States. And what it was was the notion that a politics of movement building, so long as it also had the power base of organized labor unions, an institutional power base, might, to use John Kenneth Galbraith's phrase, countervail against the power of the corporations and achieve some kind of a balance. That's the theory of the 20th century, the politics of the progressive movements. Note carefully, it was a design. It based on ideas and a power base essentially called labor unions. That system is over. We are living in a period, the United States never had a strong design. We were at 32 or 34 percent of the labor force at its peak as the institutional power base. The Swedes were at 86 percent, the organized labor. But the countervailing power was always weak. Labor is now down to 11 percent of the labor force organized, 6 percent in the private sector, and the conservative politics of the corporations and the right wing movements are going after it. I'm from Wisconsin, they've destroyed the unions in Wisconsin, and they are ripping that whole system apart. So you are left facing, in institutional design terms, the giant corporation and its power base. That is new in the modern era. You have to go back to the late 1890s to see it. And at that time, there was another power base, not only the buildup of unions, but really angry farmers working off the farm system. So that poses a question as the decay continues and as income distribution gets worse, as the capacity to deal with environmental strategies gets worse, 
at the capacities to deal not only with Trump, but almost any conservative politician gets worse and where limitations of the design become obvious. So you're right up against the question. We are right up against the question. And it isn't always that ideas are central. If you don't like corporate capitalism and you don't like state socialism, what is it you want? And why would it be better? And how could it be developed? And what is the way forward that actually produces a political economic design that is powerful, that has moral content, that is able to build institutional power as well as a vision of the future? How does that happen? And what does it look like if it doesn't look like the traditions of the 20th century, state socialism or corporate capitalism or the intermediate liberalism kind of balancing sort of the corporations as the trends get worse? So that's the problem this book addresses. And it's the problem Hannah Arendt puts on the table, that until we sort out a direction, we are always going to be limited in what we could do a vision that has moral content as well as political economic power at a time that the old models are dying. That's our problem, all of us, in my view. At, at another level, you can begin to ask, what is a system in political economic terms? And almost always the answer comes back, if you look closely, that it is related to who controls wealth. That is, in the medieval time, it was the lords who contained, and the churches, and the king who contained the wealth, and they called it the name of the game in politics. In the 19th century, there was a period when agriculture was so popular and the country was 85% farmers that there was a different kind of base, partly in balancing the rest of the system. The corporations arose and for a while, as I said, were balanced partly, very weakly, by labor unions, and that's gone. State socialism took another model. So ultimately, the question we're asking is, what, does we, what do we do? How can you even begin to think about a model that is democratic, but also has muscle, that has power, that has institutional capacities? So one of the things this book attempts to do is first look at what's developing out of the pain and failure of the current system, and then to put together the pieces that we see evolving with a theory, that, a theory that suggests, and I suggested to you that we can then struggle with, of how the next system might be built. Let that one sink in. The question is how to build the next system, not how to elect the next guy. Now, you've got to elect the next guy too, but the real question, if what I've said has any meaning at all, is what is the nature how do we begin to sketch it out? How do we begin to develop a theory? How do we debate that theory? This is like the time of the Federalist Papers and the Committees of Correspondence at the beginning of our country. How do we work it out so that we have a clear direction we have thought seriously about, experimented with, and begin to project something that brings us all together in a new direction? That sounds utopian. And it is in the classical sense a vision of the future. It is very much like what Madison was doing at the time they were writing the Federalist Papers. They were thinking about the design. What would work? What wouldn't work? How do we build forward? So that I want to drop in your laps. That is what used to be called a heavy trip in the 1960s. But it is the nature of the problem, I suggest to the, we cannot move much further. We can resist. We can build opposition where we can. But the deep trends that are getting worse in income distribution, environment, climate, poverty, they continue until we build a different institutional power base. One of the things that's exciting about this period, and Bob alluded to it, and is very rarely covered by the national press and almost never by the local press, is that there is a developing process around the country in which who gets to own wealth, what institutions are designed that hold wealth, is beginning to show a particular direction that is not very well understood, but is very exciting in some areas. So for instance, there are 130 million people who are involved in one or another form of cooperative. 
that is a different way of owning wealth than either the giant corporation or the lords and, and the kings of the land ownership. It is a democratic form of ownership. There are another 10 million or 15 million people in employee stock ownership plans, a different way of democratic ownership of business, neither corporate nor state socialist. There are 140 land trusts we've identified around the country. What is that? That's a geographic area, draw a circle around a neighborhood or a city. Who owns the land can be democratically owned either by the neighborhood or the city in order to control land values and inflation and prices that drive people out of the houses and gentrification. Another form of decentralized ownership of land. 25% of American electricity is generated and managed by utilities that are either cooperatives, another form, or public utilities, city-owned developments. There are many of these around as well. So if you begin looking around, you see that there are elements of a system that is socialist in that it democratically owns wealth, has an institutional power base, is growing, and might, and I use the word carefully, might suggest one element of a possible direction, a direction that begins at that level. There are even more sophisticated things happening than in many parts of the country. I want to just fill you in on this briefly, but you can go to our websites that, that www.community-wealth will give you lots and lots on this. The press doesn't cover much of it. So there's, there are other levels of this. So for instance, the public banking movement, how many know of the public banking movement? There are some people it's beginning to develop. Eight, eight years ago, there was hardly anything. We're going to get one here thanks to the lady with her hand up, who's done a great deal of work on this, a wonderful work. There are public, what is a public bank? A socialized bank in a city. Why not? The Bank of North Dakota has been there 100 years, just about 100 years now. It was established by radicals and activists and populists at the beginning of the century, last century, and that has produced a public bank that many, many people are copying. Philadelphia is on the verge of setting one up. Santa Fe is on the verge, Denver's considering it, Los Angeles, Oakland, many, many cities, and Washington, D.C., saying, why is it that the bankers control the capital? Why can we not build our own banking system? And that's a movement that's whose time is going to come because it's spreading very rapidly now that it's getting off the ground. So that's another element, public or democratically controlled, decentralized rather than state-owned, a, a populist vision of who owns the banks. And it's practical. That goes along with the three million people involved in, in credit unions, or the trillion dollars in capital already there, another form of democratic ownership of capital. Those are not yet contenders. We are certainly in the prehistory, not the history of the next great movement. These are developmental processes coming out of pain and experimentation. There are worker-owned companies around the country many of them coming out of the so-called ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Plan movement. Norman Curlin is here who helped put that together at one point. There are 13 million, last I looked, members of ESOPs and worker-owned companies. Some are democratic, most are not at this stage, but they demonstrate another institution that is neither corporate capitalism nor state socialism, but democ democratizes ownership. And some of them are becoming democratic in their control structure as well. 13 million people. There are many, many worker co-ops being set up. A co-op is a slightly different. It's a one person, one vote ownership structure. The press covers almost none of this at this time. You have to go to the websites, www.community-wealth covers this kind of developmental process just under the radar. There is almost no local press anymore that cares about this or has staffing to do it. But in some areas, it's beginning to break through. There are also sophisticated models that are popping up out of this process at the grassroots level that are beginning to get attention. One of the most interesting one is one that our own group has been, has been associated with in Cleveland, Ohio, the Evergreen Cooperatives. Now here is an advance to the next stage from cooperatives. In a city, an area of about 40,000, with an average family income of about 20,000, unemployment of 20%, almost entirely black neighborhood in Cleveland, in the midst of which are the Cleveland Clinic, one of the most powerful worldwide hospitals in the world, the, the University Hospital, Case Western Reserve University, right there. 
So what's been set up is a community-wide structure, not simply a freestanding worker-owned company, to which are attached cooperatives as part of a complex to build the community as well as to have democratic ownership. That's an advance in the model. And each one of the co-ops kicks back something to the center so that it can be a revolving fund to set up more co-ops and to build out this larger complex. These are not small co-ops. There is a, one of the largest and most advanced and greenest laundries in the United States there in the urban area. There is a terrific urban greenhouse there, three million heads of lettuce a year. There's a solar installation structure, and they're building out one a year or two, year, two a year. They hope to add businesses that are worker-owned, part of the complex. Think about that, and think about design. That is a design aimed at building community and worker ownership, not simply freestanding worker ownership. There is a collective and co comprehensive vision there. What makes it doubly interesting is that in the middle of this area where these large hospitals and universities are, there is huge purchasing power largely financed by the, us, the taxpayers, healthcare, Medicare, Medicaid programs, hospital programs in general, that is in the middle of this complex, trillion dollars in the United States, if you look at what the sum total of this is, they buy a lot. They could buy from these institutions. They could stabilize the community. They could use their procurement power to stabilize the system. And that indeed is what's happening in Cleveland as the model is developed they're using that next level. Now, those of you who are economists, if you stand back and think about that little design, and systems are about ideas of design, that is a community building, wealth democratizing, decentralized combination of community and worker ownership, supported by quasi-public procurement, through a planning system using public monies, quasi-public monies, mostly public monies. That is a planning system, a beginning shape of a planning system. If you were to do that nationally, the next time General Motors goes down and Chrysler, they might be taken over publicly. They were nationalized. That may happen again. They might be converted to having build mass transit. That mass transit might be targeted to companies to build community in the same way that Cleveland is. And you begin to see the outlines in a sketch of a model that is neither state socialist nor corporate capitalist, but begins with a vision of community, democratizing as far as you can from the ground up, building capacity at the national level or the regional level to purchase and thereby stabilize the system in a form of economic planning. Now, think about those things. Those are ideas in a fragmentary developmental process as the pain of the system grows and there are no other solutions. Let me repeat that. This is not happening just because people think it's a great thing to waste 8 to 10, 15 years to build these things. It's happening because the logic of the environment is such that either you innovate or you go down. And that is the situation in many, many parts of the country. And so there is an enormous amount of innovation that's happening. Ten years ago, you could see fragments of it. If you wanted to get, I have dealt with the steel workers in Youngstown, Ohio in 1977 who were trying to do this with a big steel mill that went down. And they got the Carter administration to support them and ultimately they were cut off at the pass by the big corporations. Not, and there weren't many people who knew how to do this. You want to do this in your community? There's now an enormous amount of talent and knowledge available to do it. That's a historic achievement because you can build with that achievement. So that is happening now at a very different level of sophistication, even though the press doesn't cover it. So what you're beginning to see, and I could give you many, many more models that are on the ground, including 25% of American electric electricity is already in the public sector, public utilities or cooperatives already and many pieces of the puzzle are building at the local level, largely out of pain and largely out of failure. So that gives you one thought about possibility. One of the possibilities in practice may be the continued pain levels growing, the lack of solutions from Washington, indeed from Washington more pain, the necessity to develop models that are homegrown and have the quality of democratizing ownership 
and building up the slow infrastructure of something whose time might come. That's where we are, and I think that's a big part of what's happening. It's also important to say, and I mentioned it earlier, the processes at the national level are also open to change. We did, in fact, in a banking crisis, nationalize General Motors, Chrysler, the biggest, uh, biggest uh, insurance company, AIG, in the world, and there could have de facto, had we wanted to do it, been the nationalization of several other banks. We are not at the end of the economic crises at the national level. But if you begin to see the model that I'm sketching to you, and I speak as a historian as well as a, someone very interested in politics, there are elements and fragments of what can only begin to look like the possibility of a next system that doesn't look like corporate capitalism, and it doesn't look like state socialism, and it's radically decentralized and begins in community and decentralization, but begins to offer a vision that very well might be commanding because it has so much build up from the ground up. I use the word might carefully. It may also decay. We shall see. But we are also seeing beginning, beginning activity to put this into politics. Politicians are beginning to run on this or think it's important to be the mayor who does this. Rochester, Minnesota, for instance, looking at the Cleveland model, and the wonderful, the wonderful mayor whose name is Lovely Warren, I love that name, it's her first name, has picked up this model and is doing the same thing, doing a Cleveland-style model in that city. In Arlington, in Alexandria, there's another attempt to do something similar to this. I'm sorry, in Richmond, there's another attempt to do something similar to this also in Atlanta. So that's one level, there is something bubbling up because other solutions are not available. And the ideas of a, the ideas of a possible decentralized democratic economy are becoming something on the ground level and have not yet broken into public national press except very occasional stories. At a very different level, if you go to Boulder, California, uh, Bo I'm sorry, Boulder, Colorado, you will see that a activist group working for 10 years on climate change, attacking the local privately owned utility for the use of fuels that were poisoning the environment, has taken over that utility through a political fight. And what has it done? It made it into a city owned utility where you can control the output of the utility. That's another model that's building. I won't go on endlessly about this, but just below the surface, we are seeing enormous experimentation of the kind I'm talking about, plus occasional crisis developments. One final bit. If you look back at the Federalist Papers and you look back at Madison, Madison was a very interesting guy, and he has many lessons for us. Uh, Madison, like Karl Marx, was very clear about how politics worked. He's very explicit about it in all of his writings. Those who have wealth control politics, period. The task of those with wealth is to keep the others divided so they don't take your wealth away, period. Marx, Marx never said it as clearly as, as Madison did. And furthermore, the way to really control the system, this is Federalist Papers, one of ten, not 10, 9, I can't remember which one it is, it's Madison. What you do is spread the country out. Remember, there's a fight. Democracy could only happen in small countries. They decided if we spread people out, it's very explicit. You can divide and conquer the people as they are spread out around the country. A continent has that advantage, and that's the name of the game. What's beginning to be picked up in different parts of the country, all of this, I say as a historian, the possible prehistory of the next movement, is the development of a reaction to that. The first place we saw it, not surprisingly, was in a reactionary form. The Texas governor said, we're going to secede. Now, he was kidding, maybe. But he was, he was saying, we don't like this system. Texas, by the way, is going to be very interesting as Hispanics get the vote over the next 25 years. Do not think of Texas as a right-wing state forever. The, the action there is going to be very interesting. California, there's a state movement after what happened in the last election for exit or Brexit of some kind of decentralization. In New England, there's a de facto organization of regional air policies, energy policy, agricultural policies. There is a regionalization going on underneath the surface that also looks very interesting in terms of the model. If you think about systemic change, 
And what I'm, I'm giving you examples, but what I'm urging at this book is that it's time to think through what might make sense if the existing models, corporate capitalism and state socialism, don't do it. And if some of these elements give suggestive possibilities, and the people in this room and elsewhere will build more suggestive newer possibilities, that we are at the verge of beginning to have an idea of what the next system could look like, maybe. And it, what it looks like is radical decentralization and democratization of wealth, probably a lot of small entrepreneurs, probably public ownership or public worker community ownership at the larger levels, probably regionalization. Continents are, people, folks remember how big the country is. You can drop Germany into Montana and have a lot of room left over. I sometimes used to say to my students, those dinky little European countries are easy to manage because they're small. But the idea of a continental system where people are spread out, that's beginning also to you see reactions to it, New England and California and in Texas particularly, where there is the beginning of a reshaping. I am no, no utopian. I am interested in what might be built and what might be building in the way that the women's movement, the civil rights movement, and the conservative movement, which was very self-conscious about this for 30 years before they got anywhere, what we might build out of the collapse at the top, out of the loss of the opportunities of social democracy or liberalism, but also out of the new experimentation. So that, that's the introduction to this talk. <laughs> the rest of it's here. <laughs> and by the way, this is free on, we on the web for organizers and activists, anybody who wants them. We, we're making them free because we think it's important for organizers and activists who are beginning to really read and think about the future. So go to, go to our website, The Next System, and you'll find it there under principles, Next System, principle, www.thenextsystem, and then slash principles. The book then attempts to ask very much deeper questions than these fragmentary bits and pieces I'm suggesting to you. Exactly how would you organize a community-based structure? And what do we know about that? And who's been writing about that? What do we know about decentralization? What do we know about regionalism? What do we know about climate control? that build, builds on these kinds of models. What, and there's an enormous amount being written in different areas. So the book attempts to take these pieces and fragments and sketches that I've given you all too short a time about what a next system might look like and what a next system that is plural in its design might involve. So let me say a word about that. The title, title of the book is Principles and the title of the model is A Pluralist Commonwealth. Terrible title, terrible mouthful, but it, meant, it is meant to designate the notion that common wealth, democratically owned worker companies or land trusts or utilities or national or regional structures, regional structures like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a large publicly controlled st structure from the 1930s, that that form, plural forms rather than state socialism or corporate capitalism of common wealth holding is a model very appropriate to American circumstances and American culture and, and American populism in the small p sense, in the sense of roll up your sleeves and do it, that that's a possibility. And then it examines how that might actually look if you actually put together in much greater detail than I can obviously do here, what, it's, what, it, what it would take and, and what, what the problems are, what we've learned, what we haven't learned, how you could build on this in your own community. And so part of this is going on, as you probably know, particularly young people, there are study groups and study political groups all over the country thinking about these kinds of questions of where do we go, and it's, it's addressing this at all levels of how we might begin to put together a politics that is a real politics, at the same time a community building structures and community building activity might be built. I was out in Arlington about a month ago where that, just that possibility is beginning to emerge. Might we do a land trust here? but also build a politics with a different content there and do both at once and walk on two legs of uh, possibility is the idea. So that's the notion of the pluralist commonwealth. I want to say one or two other concepts about it and then just situate it in a different sense. In the, uh, in the 20th century, just past, the economy produced a seven-fold increase in per capita income. Think about that. Start out with $1,000, you had $7,000 at the end of the century doing the same amount of work, or $100,000 and $700,000. That's the power of the old technologies, sevenfold. 
If you divide the income up right now in the United States, you all know, of course, it's about $240,000 for every family of four. You all getting your share? That, that's what this rich economy does. That number will be almost two million if the weak technologies of the 20th century continue. If the advanced computer-driven technologies, we may go further than that, which means that the bounty of the country is, at the same time that the system ideas are failing, the bounty of the country is growing through technological possibility. So that a woman born now, a woman born at the end of the century will have, just for starters, seven times as much money as the 240, about a million dollars, or a 20-hour week and a half a million dollars or a 10 hour a week and a quarter million dollars. Those are the kinds of numbers we're looking at as we move through the new century. So the question then becomes, how do we build a democratic way to manage that wealth and ownership? So the problem is not simply about poverty and environment and the difficulties. It is how do we build a culture and a system that can actually appropriate these wealth, this wealth as we go forward. So it's a forward looking question as well. So I want to suggest to you that possibility and it's the, the content of this gives lots and lots and lots of references to the kinds of things I'm talking about, as well as people who are writing about individual parts of this in different ways in different parts of the country. So that's another piece of the puzzle that's in, that I think may be useful and important to you. So finally, I want to give you one different way of thinking about system change. Uh, I'm a historian, political economist, and as, as I mentioned earlier, I've been involved in you know, very hard politics, the real world politics, so I'm, I've, uh, I'm not a utopian in that sense. But system change is, in fact, a constant in history. It happens all the time. So the people who think it doesn't happen are the utopians. The question is whether or not you can build to and through the difficulty and actually take responsibility for what might become a systemic change. We may have faced very hard times in this country. There's no doubt, I think, that what Mr. Trump is offering us may produce violence and repression and a great deal of difficulty. So I think the, the guiding light is not only what is it we want. I'm really talking to the person in your chair. What is it we want politically? How do we get beyond rhetoric? How do we move to the next stage? How do we get serious? And secondly, how do we move to and through the difficult times? Chile is a wonderful model. They move to and through the difficult times of repression and dictatorship. I hope, I hope we don't face dictatorship, but we may face a great deal of repression. And it doesn't need to stop there. One final word, my great heroes that some of you know, and a way of thinking about system change and what might really be done, are the people working on civil rights in Mississippi in the 1930s. That's when the real work was done laying the groundwork which became possible in the 1960s for the movement that came late, comes later and came later. I think we're on the verge of that at a much, much bigger, bigger possibility that the entire system, I think, is opening up deeper and deeper questions that I certainly have never seen in my life. And I think most of us are beginning to think about it in political terms. But the next advance is system terms and how we move that ball forward in a thoughtful, intelligent, and actually rigorously defined and thought about way. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now, now comes the question of challenge. Let's go. Kate, Kate Lee, we'll give you a... All right. I do want to say a word for John Duda, who's not here. I don't know if I mentioned him at the outset, but John, who is our, our communication director, helped enormously with this as well. How's that? Is that better? Okay. So, looks like we have a question back here. <laughs> My old friend Norman. Hi, Norman. <laughs> Hi, Gar. Beautiful. You, you did a great job. Now, the founders <laughs> didn't give the vote to those without property. 
as you recall. Yes. And it took some time before others than males were able to get the vote. Uh, but there was something else. Whatever you're talking about, I happen to agree with your vi that the, the need for a new vision, and I, I think many of the things you said I agree with. But money is very, very important. Where you got the money for Cleveland, for example, there was foundations, uh, nonprofit groups with a lot of money. And then sometimes there are some rich guys who are going to give you some money. And then it's the government. And then you have to, you have to bend a little to, to conform to what the bureaucrats and what Wall Street permit, as you understand. I'm wondering what your definition is of money. And as you know, with the ESOP, workers have bought out companies on bank credit they pay no corporate taxes, and they paid nothing out of their savings or anything out of their earnings. So that there are companies that are 100% owned by the workers, yes. and I'm not satisfied with any of them, to tell you the truth. Thank you. Because there's more that can be done. But okay. I, I, I want to ask the question because I think ownership not only can be for workers, but why not for every citizen as a citizen right? Because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says every person should be able to become an owner, and no country does that yet. And I'm wondering how that's reflected in how the money system that you're thinking of, what is money and how can that be brought about? I like what you're saying about co-op banks because I think that's part of the answer. Norman and I have been discussing this for 40 years, and thank you. <laughs> and Norman, was, Norman worked very closely with a man named uh, Kurland, who, who, uh, who helped open up this dimension of worker ownership, it's a very important dimension. Uh, I can't give you a full answer in this discussion because those of you who are following the modern monetary theory, which is another piece of this, the creation of money, you all know money is created out of nothing. That's what the, bank, that's what the banks do. And then they lend it out and build out more and more. Uh, and so there's a whole revolution going on in monetary theory, which is part and parcel of this. So the definition of money becomes very, very illusory, and I, can't, I really can't go into it without a long discussion, Norman. But it, I do want to credit the people who built the ESOPs, including the folks around Kelso and you, because they gave us a model of worker ownership, it not, but not often very democratic, in, because it's, not, it's voted by the number of stocks you have. And often it's voted by a bank who controls the stock, but the idea of ownership has changed, and that was a major change forward, and so we want to credit that work. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Scar, for mentioning the public bank, and I do want to share exciting information with people. I've been keeping it very quiet, but I think I'm... I have courage to say it now, and that is we do have major funding through the 25th fiscal year 2018 budget for a feasibility study for the public bank. $200,000 is in the budget, and um, we have just, I think, gotten it to be not just small business, but also loans for affordable housing and loans for environmental sustainability. We just got that language in. Now I think the challenge, I mean, this is a room full of activists and people who understand, I think, a lot of what's wrong with the system, is to take this and move it to how do we begin to use it to fund cooperatives, to fund land trusts, to really begin to change the economy right here in DC. Let's not talk abstractly. Let's talk right here about what we're going to do over the next few years to be prepared that when the feasibility study is done and we begin to get the money going into the public bank, how are we going to use it for system transformation right here in DC? And I hope everybody in this room is going to help with it. There's interest, in just, just to, to say one thing, the process that we were just talking about at the national level with the creation of the tax arrangements for ESOPs was done by just that kind of initiative. In many cities, what you're talking about, what you're actually doing is actually happening just below the radar. So the movement is building up in this way, 
not hardly covered by the press. It's going to be discovered one of these days, and then it's going to be, we'll have some interesting fights, but it'll be very interesting that what's going on in many, many parts of the country. Thank you for a great talk and great work. Would you say a few words about how you view system change at a global level? That's a very interesting question. I do want to, let me add one piece to the last part to close that off. Partly, I'm talking in terms of systemic design and models. That's a very superficial and pragmatic way to describe systemic change. The name of the game ultimately is transforming the culture into a culture of democracy. And that, but it requires design and systemic design. So that's piece, a piece of the puzzle. As to the international part, uh, for my sins, I once worked at the very high level in the State Department as well as the House and Senate. And my, my recollection of those days goes something like this. It's a very exaggerated form of recollection. People would come with, up with a really good idea to help out someone in Africa or a new project in Africa or South America that could be funded with American dollars. The AID programs were all ready to go. But by the time it hit the ground, somehow the corporations had turned it into something else. Why? because that's where the power was, it's, and that was their intent. Let's not even make it about good or bad or evil. The institutional power of the large corporation had interests and found ways to manifest it. So partly I view the work on rebuilding an American commonwealth, a different community, as necessary setting the terms of reference of who we are in our foreign policy. Let me say that again. I also have written about the bombing of Hiroshima, a, a, a very unpleasant and ugly story in the name of American global theory and vision of how to, the, how to run the global economy in a way to prevent wars. Hiroshima was unnecessary. Virtually every major general, if you don't know, went, an admiral went public after the war saying it was totally unnecessary and was outrageous, including Eisenhower as, be, as president. So the issue that, that has driven a lot of the questions that you're asking. I don't think we are going to relate differently to other parts of the world until we are different. That's a very hard line that we can try but the, and that we should try, but actually until we change our institutions, our politics and our culture, we are probably going to be beaten at the past by the large corporate interests. So I, I urge that those of you who are really thinking seriously about global issues, this is part of the name of the game. How do we change the underpinnings as well? Thank you so much. Um, uh, I think that this question is related to the one about global, but um, the framing here is about the next system, but I've heard you speak, well, you also referenced like regionalization and city level change. So to what extent is the next system, like many smaller systems, and if so, is there kind of an overarching system? And then really quickly, I would love the name of the group doing the community land trust work in Arlington. That's a tag on. You like that? Yeah. Yes, great. Um, so that's a good question. I probably have used the word too, gener too, 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 too diverse. The name of the game ultimately is in, in, in societies that are structured as national systems, and most are. There are a couple who aren't. But then the question is how those systems are managed and what is the power structure and the economic structure and what is the politics and polity of that system. So that's what I'm talking about. Always large systems like capitalism or socialism or a pluralist commonwealth system always are made up of smaller bits and pieces. One of the interesting bits and pieces about the United States, here's, here's an interesting fact for those of you. If you're, if you're a free, free enterprise person, I am for small businesses. There are about six million of them in the country. Two one hundredths of one percent are giant corporations. So you can be very much for the little guy or the innovative guy who's trying to do something in communities and then change the name of the game when you look at who's controlling the game in Washington, the power structure. So it's a, in this model, the theory is that unless you can build up a different culture at the local level, let me say it again, unless we can change who we are at the local level, it will not change at the national level, ultimately. You can't skip steps. Now, that's a very challenging, you, you say that and you've got to do like those folks in Mississippi in the 1930s. The name of the game is 10 years of your life times three times four. That, that's the name of the game. You want, if you want to deal with system change, you're talking about decades, not just weeks. That doesn't mean you can't do things now and here and now, but the longer term trend is that, that level of demand. 
And that level of, I've been talking about, you know, by the way, <laughs> I should clarify, I've been talking about systemic designs. All of this is really about existential choice, not systemic designs. It always comes down to what the person in your chair wants to do. And that's at the heart of this. What motivates people to take on real responsibility for the system? It's very personal. So it's all, you've got to think about it. But I would urge you to think about it as to, not isn't that interesting, maybe we should think about that. But am I up to that, changing the system? You know, not, a lot of folks have asked that question and done it. So, you know, it's no big deal. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you very much, Gar. Be you know, I admire you. I think that you're so consistent and so brilliant, and you explain so well. And maybe That's a I close already. Friend talking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think I already asked you because I follow Gar everywhere. Um, I already asked you this question. I think it was done in a different way. Coming from Latin America, I remember 27 years ago saying. There are no strikes in this country. Where are the workers? And they said, oh, no, no, you know, they are all dead. So coming from South America where the workers are so empowered by the trade unions, I wonder how, who is going to do this change? Because I think that workers need to be empowered to move to a different system. And if trade unions, as I was told, are dead, um, you know, changes come, we, we will change it if we are determined, but the workers need to be empowered in order to have the experience that they can change the system. Right. So I want you to explain to me again, maybe I already asked you something around this in another meeting, but thank so, you, Gar, this is... So Great. So let me, I, don't have a, I don't think any of us have an answer to your question, so that's the first thing. But the model that began, as you have put it, the workers taking over, is a particular historical model. And it has different variants. Trade union is one variant. They were much more mobilized and much more activist, both in your own country and in, at the end of the 19th century, much more militant outside of union structures. Union structures, in a way, brought it to a narrower form. I think we're seeing different forms of activism that will include workers at different levels, but will include very different groups. That's what we're seeing, that, that is citizen groups of a different kind. Black Power, Black Lives Matter is a part of this. By the way, in Jackson, Mississippi, the same kinds of things that I've been talking about here is, is the program of the new mayor. And so they're going forward, and that's a real highlight for black citizens of what's happening in Mississippi, with the heart of where the really worst part of racism occurred. So Jackson is a place to watch. I don't think it's going to be trade unions. I think it's going to be militant people, but I don't think the union structure is going to be the basis of it, though it certainly can be part of it, what's left of, what's left of the union structure. Sorry. Hi, thank you so much for the talk and for pro uh, providing so many resources for us who are uh, people who are interested in these issues. I'm wondering uh, if you were advising folks who want to work on these things on the ground uh, within the political structure. What kind of ideas and what kind of rhetoric do you think are the most powerful tools uh, for someone who is running for local office? Oh, I should ask, I should ask Bob Borsas, who's here to talk about that. The, uh, we're beginning, we're, and we've had some conversations with, with uh, different political groups. I don't think we know the answer to it. I think that's really an exciting experiment. People are going to test it out. But we are finding these kinds of things can be very popular. They start at the local community, they are popular, they're meaningful. Uh, you just, I don't think there's a specific answer to your question. I think there's a lot of testing to do. But uh, go for it. Give it a shot. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it right here. Um, I just I wanted to ask, if you look over you know, the long durée, diachronically speaking, um, you typically see new economic models co-evolve with new cultural forms. Um, and I'm wondering, what, what role do you think that different types of cultural production, novels, art, play in kind of helping foster and develop these new, this new 
economic model that you're articulating? Um, and do you already see it happening? And if so, where? No, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Uh, I haven't seen it in an organized way, but almost every kind of meeting I've had in local communities, some artist has done something very creative around what's going on. And it, not only in visual arts, but in plays and songs and demonstrations of different kind. And I think that's always part of a movement. A movement that doesn't sing is not a movement. So, and a movement that doesn't paint is not a movement. So it sounds like, are you an artist? Uh, no, cultural studies professor. Okay. Uh, well, well, get your students out into the, out into the <laughs> grassroots. You may see more of it already than I do then. Probably surveying it, right. Hi. Um, so you talked a little bit about how like nationalization of major industry is possible. Like we nationalized GM and AIG, but that only really happened after massive economic shock that created the circumstances under which these like things that we would consider to be pretty radical could actually happen because people were kind of shocked out of their ways of thinking and wanted to take actions that would like save all of us, right? Um, so from this, you might have noted, I've like read the shock doctrine pretty recently. <laughs> it's like pretty, it um, pretty present for me. But I'm like, so radical conservative like economic actors have taken advantage of economic and political disasters or like created them. You mentioned Chile in your talk. Um, so like that, so where violence or disaster and free market reform kind of go hand in hand because we're take like they take advantage of those circumstances where people are like unable to politically protest. So I'm wondering, kind of given these circumstances under which we did manage to nationalize corporations, should we be teaching organizers to also take advantage of like earth shattering crises to push through reform that we see as like making the world a better place as well, because we certainly know that that's happening in the other direction. I think I think any any big any serious social movement, including revolutionary movements or non-revolutionary movements, are never pure. They involve all kinds of mixes of, of organizing and development and cultural processes and takeovers and different kinds. I don't think we are given the costs of. I mean, let me say it, given the human costs of what's going on in this system, the poverty, the degradation, the people are just strung out on heroin who can find no jobs, the loss of belief, the deaths, there are very large stakes involved. This is not a, a toy, this game. And some of it's going to involve takeovers of that kind, and some are going to involve the evolutionary cultural change. That always, always revolutions are, of, whether you call it a revolution or an evolutionary transformation, they're never pure and simple, but the stakes are so high that I think as best we can to keep it within the framework of the values, but expect that there will be some problems. I, I think that's inevitable. Yes, I, I wonder if I could um, extend this a little bit to some of the other things you've been writing about, uh, particularly with respect to climate change, of climate change. And you've written, I think, in, in a piece in The Nation and some other places that uh, we don't have time, and there really needs to be a major transformation at the top level of our political economy, which includes, uh, you've mentioned, I believe, um, buying up fossil fuel corporations uh, to keep it in the ground, uh, transforming our banking system, transforming our transportation system and others. And so I wonder, first, how... Uh, how we sequence these, the, we, this is, you've talked today about uh, building slowly, but clearly there's a greater air urgency that's threatening uh, life itself, I think. And then second, how this, the, the politics of that at the national level can uh, be reconciled with a need to regionalize, which you've also talked about in very compelling fashion. So, uh, that's, there's a lot in that question, so, in those two questions. So, so look, uh, uh, any transformation is a messy business. There are going to be a lot of different levels of activity, some cultural and slow, some straight political, some very active, some, some even there'll be violence and struggle. All sorts of things are already happening that are not some simple, clear things. That's not the way it works. But th that ju just to say that. 
So the development, nonetheless, the development of a systemic culture that is radically decentralized, which is another word for that's the only way I have democracy, that becomes a driving vision, I think, building up what the Catholic Church says only to the next level if necessary is, I think, a, a valuable kind of guideline for where we ought to go in the long haul. There are crises, and climate change is one of them. What, what the, the, the questioner is asking about, now I should mention this very briefly, um, there's a piece we did in The Nation, but we've been, we did a piece at a big conference in Oberlin with, on climate change. How many know what quantitative easing is? Okay. How many know what new monetary, modern monetary theory is? Oh, hey, great. So what is, so let me give you an explanation and when, one of the things that we think is urgent that could be done. Um, the Federal Reserve Board creates money out of nothing every day. That's by computer. Otherwise, the economy could never expand. If there was a little pot of money that was fixed, it, that's it. So you, you have to wrap your head around the fact that that's what's happening. And the word quantitative easing speaks to a $3 trillion effort in the last couple of years that they did to kind of flood the banks with enough capital. The European banks are doing it right now. The Japanese banks, we've, we've halted for a while. The Japanese banks do it all the time. That's the way the monetary system works. If you let that sink in, and there's a whole development called modern monetary theory, it's happening worldwide, facing up to the implications of that in modern times, or, th or think about it this way. I had, a, I had a wonderful aunt in Racine, Wisconsin, where I'm from, who was a baker. And she had this wonderful comment. She said, you know, I was there during the Depression, and there wasn't much money around. And then they, they had this big war, and there was a lot of money around, all of a sudden. Uh-huh, yes. So when, they, when you want to do it, you can, in fact, as Milton Friedman also pointed out, create the money the way you usually do and use it for these purposes. One of which we have proposed to begin thinking about now would be to buy up these big oil companies and get them out of the way politically. That could be done. We put it, we put that, we know that's not going to happen with the current regime, but we put it out now so that people can stew on it for the next two or three or four years and see whether or not the climate change activists pick it up and go for it. So that's kind of one way to think about uh, an answer to your question, but I, I probably should stop there unless you want to sharpen something, that I, sharpen the question a little further, because I've probably opened a door that people don't want to go through right now. The need for power at the national level, the national government, to take those radical actions versus the need for the talking about building from the ground up and also regionalization. It's, the, the model is always both and. You have to develop the power base at the bottom, inevitably, or you don't have any power. There may be moments you can move at the national level because an opportunity arises. So there is nothing that's fixed or simplified or oversimplified about it. I mean, the, the guiding principle from my perspective would be you don't have democracy unless you build it from the bottom up, community by community by community. You don't have it until you actually have citizens, and you don't get citizens without starting at the bottom. All right, so I think we probably have time for like two more questions. So I'm going to go to Steve and then back there. Hi. Um, so I think I want to ask, you know, there's a lot of questions I could ask, but I'll ask this one, which is really about, so there are 130 million co-op members. There are 10 to 13 million ESOP members. It's quite conceivable, I haven't seen polling data, but it's quite conceivable that Trump won both of those constituencies. You know, yep. yeah, you know, it's, it's you know, like uh, when when there was a White House meeting with the co about with co-ops, you know, there was a question asked of people in the audience of the Obama administration, you know, who here is a member of co-op? Nobody raised their hand. And then they asked, you know, who's a member of a credit union? And Jack Lew, who's Treasury Secretary, raised his hand, right? You know, so there's like a lack of understanding. And really, how do you think about? This question of going, you know, the, I think the old Marxist phrase would be something like class in itself to a class for itself. But really, um, yeah. when do co-op members start identifying as co-op members or ESOP members start identifying as employee owners? And therefore, you know, that helps achieve a different policy. That's, that's a really important question that Steve's asking. Steve Dubu, who's long worked with us and knows more about this than any of us in the room, including me. Uh, one, of, one of the questions... The, the issue is not simply structure. If you don't have a structure that is structurally compatible with democratic control, 
you really have a problem. And that's most, most economic structures are not compatible with democratic control. They are controlled by the number of stocks the rich per piece or, the, or the pension funds have. So changing ownership is, not, is a necessary but certainly not sufficient condition to transform the country into a democratic culture that was genuinely democratic. That's the name of the game. And we have to do that as a whole different level. But I'm trying to suggest to you to open up that there is an opening for that as these different, at least structurally open, and many of them are culturally open, and our the, the work that you did, for instance, in Buffalo, where there's a very active, the Steve wrote a report on, on what's going on in Buffalo, there's a very active culture building up a whole different basis that could become transformative in different economic institutions. So we're not, to say structure alone is the answer is obviously a mistake. But it is also clear that structures permit certain possibilities in certain cases and close off possibilities in other cases. And what we're trying to say is democratic structures are possible in the economic realm now. I guess one more question, I think. Is that it? Someone back here have one? Did you have this gentleman's had his hand up, Katie. Okay, oh, we'll have two. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard to see. Right here. This. Okay. Actually, it's, it's a two part question. First of all, we haven't really haven't talked about how, if the wealthy people have a lot of wealth, they obviously want to hold on to it. How do you get it away from them? That's point one. And point two <laughs> is. <laughs> Point two is that... That's point two, too. Isn't right. It? Uh, the point two is very. Is also, if you think about state socialism, corporate capitalism, social democracy in Europe, one thing they all had in common is they preserved wage systems so that there was a dynamic which some people were getting wealthier than others, and that eventually led to what we have today. Mm -hmm. So I think if you want to change that dynamic, you have to think about how are we going to get away the idea that that people are entitled to a wage. That what you do, if you do more skilled stuff, you get more. If you do less skilled stuff, you get less. And so there's that built-in inequality developing, which eventually gets you to some people very wealthy and other people being very poor. Right. So um, in, the, in the real world of politics, probably the answer to the first question is, it all depends. <laughs> it may be, there may be a major takeover through political processes, and, or there may be buyouts forced buyouts or, or friendly buyouts. Uh, in revolutionary situations, there are takeovers. So the, on the large end, there are many, many realms and ranges of doing that. Ronald Reagan nationalized the, the bank in Chicago when it was in trouble. So we, there are different possibilities at that level. The wage structure question is really interesting because a whole other piece of this is something called basic income, the debate about basic income. And what is that about? That there ought to be guaranteed income for everyone no matter what, as part of the product of the society. It is a, another way of thinking. Let me mention this. What, it's a piece of the puzzle that progressives haven't thought about in this particular frame. And one of the places I honor genuine conservatives. Now, I, let me use the word genuine, because <laughs> there are a lot of phony conservatives. But I mean, people have really thought about it. The serious argument for conservative economics was that if you had small independent farmers and small independent businesses, they provided a basis scattered throughout the country for people where they could stand on their own feet and be free and have a basis for liberty. That was a serious argument and, and I honor that argument. The left didn't take up, has not had a theory of liberty. And that's one of the big failings. But the basic income argument, which is guaranteed income or a guaranteed job, is the equivalent of the small farmer standing free on his own land. So if you want to think about it in very ordinary terms, people who are academics, as I once was, thank God no longer, <laughs> have tenure. And what does that mean? You can do whatever you want and say whatever you want and they don't fire you. That's a guaranteed job and that's a basis of liberty. We're going to see some of that, I think, in the next round of the possible reforms that people are talking about or basic income. That is to say, distributing some of the income just directly to people as a matter of course. So these are also in the mix. It, this is a very, very fertile moment, by the way. In, in all these realms, there's enormous debate about all these, one of which is basic income and, the, and theories of liberty. I think we have to leave it there. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Gar. And thank you all for coming. Uh, if you want to hear the rest of the talk, you can buy the book at the back table. Or you can also get it free online um, at www.thenextsystem.org backslash principles. So thanks again for coming and have a good night.